Theater at Galvanize Law. Um, we're a progressive law firm focused on serving the needs of the construction industry. Um, and so I hope that the information I present to you today is helpful. Um, risk, let's talk about risk. Risk is inevitable um, in the construction industry. In any project, you're gonna have risk. It's something that is just, it comes with the territory. Um, risk allocation is something that is usually a topic uh, discussed when you're talking about your contracts. Um, so contractors and subcontractors are, you know, negotiating back and forth with terms seeking to shift risk. Um, however, there are two other methods um, that I'm gonna talk about today that involve protecting against risk that is beyond your contract. And that is surety bonds and commercial general liability insurance. So uh, just an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, first, we're going to talk about bonds, the role of bonds on projects, different types of bonds and the different types of risk protection that those bonds provide. Um, and then the differences between bonds and insurance. They are very different things. Um, and then we're going to talk about insurance, the role of insurance in construction defect litigation, um, notice of claim processes and how to provide notice to your insurance carrier. Um, if there's a claim against you and uh, the insurance's role in providing your defense if you're ever sued. Okay, so first let's talk about bonds and the role of bonds on construction projects. Um, you're going to see bonds most often and some of you may already have experience with this, um, but you're gonna see bonds mostly in public sector projects. Um, but just in general, a surety bond is, is there to ensure project completion within the terms of the contract. And it's there to guard against if a contractor, for example, experiences a cash flow problem, the surety may assist that contractor. Or if the contractor abandons the job, the surety may replace the contractor so that um, the job can be completed. Um, Typically, a performance bond will be required by law or by rule for a major public construction project. There's a lot of different levels of statutory requirements. You've got the federal level, the state level, the local level. Those are going to vary um, depending on what type of public project it is. The purpose of this is to protect taxpayer dollars um, and assure you know, the lowest bidder or the bidder who who wins you know, that scope of work for the project is actually capable of completing the project. Um, and it's payment protection for the subcontractors and materials suppliers um, on a project. But you will also see um, surety bonds come up in the private sector. Usually it's gonna be on your larger projects. Um, it is discretionary in the private context, so it'll depend on the owner or the developer um, and, you know, typically if it's a larger project, they really want to be sure that um, the contractors on the project can actually complete it and they'll want a bond to sort of protect against the risk of someone uh, encountering difficulty during the project or not completing. So we're going to talk about just three different kinds of bonds. Um, performance bond is one type. There's payment bonds and then bid bonds. Um, so performance and payment bonds are usually the ones you hear about the most. Um, performance bonds are issued by one party to the contract to the other party as a guarantee against the issuing party's failure to meet their obligations under the contract um, or to deliver on the level of performance specified in the contract. Um, performance bonds are typically provided by a financial institution such as a bank. Um, they can also be provided by insurance companies, but they are different from insurance. Um, the bond would typically be paid by the party providing the services under the agreement. So, for example, if you have an owner that is requiring a bond as part of the process um, under their contract, requiring a performance bond, the contractor that's being hired to perform the work is the one who's going to have to purchase this bond. Um, basically, it's a way of guaranteeing that you're going to perform the work under the contract. Um, 
So if, for example, the owner declares the contractor in default and terminates the contract for whatever reason, like non-performance or non-compliance with terms of the contract, the owner can then call on the surety to meet the obligations under the bond. Um, but as I said, performance bonds are not insurance. So they're limited, unlike insurance, they're limited to the actual bond amount um, and they're limited to the project duration. Whereas insurance, if you have insurance during a project and you get sued two years after the project is complete, that insurance would still be covering that work. So bonds are a little bit more limited um, and they're just, it's a different context. Um, next is payment bonds. Um, these are typically used to assure that the contractor will pay subcontractors, laborers, and material suppliers. It's really used most often to protect an owner or developer against liens. Um, so that in the event that a subcontractor isn't paid, um, that bond is there to pay the subcontractor instead of um, allowing that subcontractor to then file a lien against the property in order to be paid. Then we have bid bonds. Um, I haven't done a ton of work with bid bonds or, or seen it come up as much. You have performance and payment bonds come up a little bit more often in litigation um, because it has to do with people breaching their contracts are not performing under the contract, but bid bonds are a type of bond. Um, it helps eliminate unqualified bidders and facilitate competitive bidding. Basically, you're affirming that you as the contractor bidding on the project have the required funds necessary to carry out the project. And it sort of shows that, you know, when you're providing your bid and you have a bid bond, you're ensuring that if you're selected that you will be able to enter into the contract at the bid price and you will actually be able to perform that contract. Um, so it sort of is a kind of like a secondary way to sort of pre-qualify the subcontractors on the project because they will have had to gone through had to have gone through the process of um, obtaining this bid bond um, and so, you know, they've already had to be qualified for it. And so it just, it provides sort of a more competitive bid process, but it's a little bit less, um, it's more about helping the party soliciting the bids risk on, you know, if they're obtaining a bunch of bids, it kind of helps them weed through um, who's gonna be best qualified for the project. So bonds versus insurance. Um, this is something, you know, looking at them side by side, you can kind of see the difference in how bonds and insurance help with your risk protection. Um, bonds are very project specific, um, whether it's the owner in a private context requiring you to hold a bond or, you know, it's a public project where you know by law you're required at a certain dollar threshold for the project to um, have performance and payment bonds. Um, insurance on the other hand is term specific. So when you obtain insurance, you'll have a policy. Um, it functions as a contract and so it'll have a term. Usually, as many of you probably know, um, you're dealing with one year terms at a time. Um, and usually renewing every year and you have, you know, each insurance policy will be a year long. Um, so when you're talking about the coverage that that insurance provides, it's usually more on a continuous basis, even if you have multiple policies. Um, so let's say, for example, you had a project where the construction lasted two years, you would have two different policies, but you would be covered if, say, you were sued five years later. Whereas if you had a bond on that project, that bond would only be used during that project if necessary. Um, so that would be if if you encountered difficulties, if you had to go bankrupt or something during a project, that's where your bond would come into play. But it would be during the project, not after the project. Um, and just kind of to separate the two, bonds have three parties. So you have the owner or the person who's requiring the bond then you have the contractor usually who's having to obtain the bond, and then you have the surety provider. Um, 
And unlike that in insurance, you just usually have two parties. You have the insurer and the insured. Um, and so each individual contractor on a project is going to have their own insurance. They're going to have their own you know, relationship with their insurance carrier and their own policy with its own terms. Um, oftentimes you will encounter situations and I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later, um, but you'll encounter situations where the contract on the project between, let's say, the owner and the general contractor or the general contractor and the subs, that the contract will actually have requirements um, for your insurance. So it's almost like having three parties involved in the relationship because you will have to be naming um, the general contractor. If you're a subcontractor, you'll have to name them as an additional insured. So sometimes you have those requirements that are placed on you of what type of insurance you need to get or um, the threshold of coverage that you need to obtain in order to be on the project and comply with your contract. But it, it is still a relationship just between um, your insurance carrier and you as the insured um, that's governed by the policy. Um, so bonds cover just the in terms of dollar amount, bonds cover the amount of the bond. Um, it's going to vary. Uh, some projects, you know, are going to have to cover the full value of the contract. Others, it'll be a percentage of the contract. It just kind of depends. Um, and then insurance covers to the policy limit, and then you'll have a deductible, and then you'll be paying a premium, which many of you know because you all probably have had to get insurance at one point or another. Um, and then bonds are a creature of contract. Um, so, you know, it's that contract relationship that's governing um, the surety bond situation. Um, insurance is coverage for you. It is also a contract, but the coverage portion, the risk protection is protecting you against tort liability. So it's it's protecting you against if somebody is injured or um, in the case that we're going to talk about mostly today, it's if you're sued for construction defects, which is uh, typically framed as a tort of negligence. Okay, so the role of insurance on construction projects, it, you know, basically you're, you're purchasing insurance to help manage your risk and your liability, your risk primarily of being sued. Um, you could, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, construction defect liability is, as many of you know, a, a very large portion of the risk that you take on when you're doing major building. Um, you know, they have kind of a saying, if you build it, lawsuits will come. Um, you know, I think it's just kind of an unfortunate reality that we see, especially in Colorado. Um, we have very, very plaintiff friendly construction laws. Um, and so it basically has enabled many, many plaintiffs to bring lawsuits, whether they have um, merit or not. Um, so unfortunately, this does drive the cost of insurance up. And you're probably seeing those effects in your you know, day to day work. Um, construction defect liability, there's several different sort of legal theories that it can arise under. You've got breach of contract, breach of warranties. Those could be express or implied warranties. And then negligence. And negligence is really what I want to focus on today um, in terms of your construction defect liability, because negligence claims are those claims in the construction defect context that will trigger your um, commercial general liability insurance coverage. Um, and so, you know, I think if you have been sued before, this this may be very familiar to you, but hopefully many of you have never been sued. And so this may be new information, um, but this is a topic that I deal with daily. Um, many, many of the cases that come into our office are construction defect cases where a homeowner or even a commercial, you know, owner of a building um, is suing a builder uh, and then the builder usually turns around and sues whatever subcontractors have been working on that project. And at the end of the day, the insurance companies of those parties 
are the ones that are footing the bill for um, the attorneys and the experts and um, everything, all the court costs, everything involved in those lawsuits. And so I'm going to talk today about sort of ha what happens with your insurance. I think when you're when you're working on a project, you may not be actively thinking about your insurance coverage all the time. And when when you really need it, when you need it the most, um, is typically when you get sued. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about like how that relationship between you and your insurance company works during a lawsuit. So the duty to defend and indemnify is basically your insurance carrier's duty to provide the money basically behind the def your defense in the lawsuit. So that means um, in practice, an insurance carrier will have an obligation under the policy to provide you with your legal defense if you are sued in a way that triggers the defense under that policy. So in a situation where someone is bringing a claim against you, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that doesn't necessarily mean you actually receive a complaint. You don't necessarily have to be served with a lawsuit, but it can also mean you are notified by someone that there's defects with your work. Um, the way that your insurance duty to defend is triggered is by a claim alleging property damage resulting from construction defects. Um, and this is often framed as negligence. So the way I distinguish this is basically if you're just sued for construction defects and there's no resulting property damage that the person claiming the defects points to, then that doesn't, it usually doesn't trigger your policy. They're going to want the person making the claim to be pointing to there's resulting damage from this construction defect that's being claimed. And so that's kind of, you know, it's kind of a hoop that plaintiffs jump through because they really do want to trigger your policy. It just, it allows there to be deeper pockets on the other side. <laughs> and so, you know, ultimately they want to recover. And so they're going to want to trigger your insurance policy. But so that you know, when you're receiving you know, any kind of complaint about your work that seems to be in a context where it might end up being a dispute that could be litigated. Um, it's that property damage resulting from the construction defect that is going to trigger your policy. Um, the duty to defend is something legally that's interpreted broadly in favor of the insured. So in your favor as a contractor with insurance, um, meaning that when you demand a defense from your insurance company, most of the time, if there's any possible way that you could argue that it's triggered by what's happening to you, by the claim being made, then the insurance company must err on the side of providing your defense. Um, there are big penalties for the insurance carrier if they deny you a defense wrongfully. Um, so, you know, the duty to indemnify is a little bit different from that, but just at the outset before, you know, anything is proven in a lawsuit, just the claim itself, if there's any way that it could fall under your policy as being covered, then your insurance company will have a duty to defend you. Um, and that means they will need to be footing the bill to typically to retain an attorney for you and all the costs associated with defending you in litigation. Um, Applicable policies, this is a point here because, um, as I said earlier, sometimes you're going to have multiple policies since typically they are only a year long. Um, so you're going to want to look at all policies that were in effect during the construction and after the construction was complete, if that applies. Um, so, you know, sometimes we're dealing with situations where there's five different policies that are on the hook for the defense and potentially um, indemnity for the judgment. Um, named insured and additional insureds, I just put this point here to distinguish. Um, a lot of times what we see is when you have an owner, a general contractor, and subcontractors, the subcontractors often, and, and I recommend this for general contractors to require this too, um, 
subcontractor should be naming the general contractor as an additional insured on their policy. Sometimes this um, is also included in the contract. Um, I it, And I recommend that too, because it just, it provides protection for the general contractor from the subcontractors who are actually performing the work. Um, so if there's a defect claim later implicating a scope of work, that subcontractor should, you know, if the general contractor gets sued for that, the subcontractor should then be looped into the lawsuit, either by being directly claims against them directly by the plaintiff or um, if just the general contractor is sued, they would have third party claims against the subcontractor. Um, and so what typically happens is that the general contractor will request uh, additional insured coverage. So the subcontractor's policy would be covering the GC as well. Um, and then reservation of rights letters. Um, in practice, an insurance carrier will often, because they have to um, interpret their duty to defend broadly in favor of um, the insured, insurance carriers will typically agree to defend the insured, but will issue what's called a reservation of rights letter to the insured, which basically says we reserve the right to dispute coverage for this actual claim at a later date. And so, you know, often they'll say, we don't actually think that we have to cover this claim. However, we will defend you, reserving our right to argue that there's no coverage later. Um, so that's pretty much par for the course anytime um, a carrier accepts their duty to defend you. Um, they will often issue a reservation of rights letter and it's nothing to be worried about necessarily. Um, oftentimes you can resolve the case with the insurer on the hook for it, you know, paying for your defense um, and actually be able to resolve the case without ever having to get to the point where your carrier actually argues um, that they don't have they, they don't have to cover you. So that's that's lucky that the duty to defend um, can help you resolve the case entirely, even with a reservation of rights letter. Um, your carrier will probably end up settling the case before there's ever a judgment that they would then challenge um, coverage for. So let's see. Um, and I think I've mentioned this a little bit, um, but just to be clear, the duty to defend typically means that your insurance carrier will appoint an attorney to represent you in the litigation and then will pay for the cost of your defense, which would mean the attorney's fees um, and then any expert costs or court costs, um, and you would be paying your deductible for that. And I should also mention that that would include, that typically includes settlements too. So most of the cases that we get do end up settling. Um, and so, you know, there will be our client and we would be retained by the insurance company and paid by the insurance company. And then if we're able to offer the plaintiff a settlement, then the insurance company would be paying that and our client would just be paying um, their deductible. And then the case hopefully goes away if you're lucky. Um, the duty to indemnify um, is different from the duty to defend. This duty to indemnify means in indemnifying you for um, the actual damages that you would be held liable for if, if you are held liable for them. Um, this arises from the terms of the policy itself. Um, so it basically the language that's typically in the policies is that the carrier has to pay for sums the insured becomes legally obligated to pay as damages because of bodily injury or property damage, typically property damage. Um, and property damage does also include loss of use um, to which the insurance applies. And the last few words of that are very key because insurance companies will typically try to put in their policies a bunch of exclusions. So to which this insurance applies 
um, can be excluded entirely by um, exclusions listed in the policy. Um, those kind of run the gamut. There can be all kinds of different exclusions, um, but just a few to look out for that we've seen lately. Um, condominium or townhome exclusions, which mean, you know, if you're if you're sued for work that you did on a condo build or townhome build, you know, then your policy would try to exclude any any uh, indemnity for a lawsuit arising out of construction of those buildings. Um, I've also seen kind of similarly, but usually with second tier policies, um, exclusions for square footage of a house. So if it's above a certain square footage, they won't cover it. Um, or uh, exclusions in the policy requiring as a prerequisite that the general contractor have written contracts with subcontractors, naming that general contractor as an additional insured on the policy. Um, so for example, if that general contractor has a policy with an exclusion like that, and then they hire a bunch of subcontractors and don't have written contracts, if there's later a lawsuit um, over that project and there were no written contracts, then um, that exclusion could apply and the carrier could uh, refuse to indemnify for those damages. Um, but as I said earlier, these exclusions, it's not that they would apply to the duty to defend. They would be applying only to the duty to indemnify for the actual damages later on. So if you had these exclusions and let's say, let's say you have the condo exclusion and you worked on a condo project and then you got sued for the work on that project for construction defects, um, your carrier would have to defend you and they would probably issue a reservation of rights pointing to this exclusion and saying, and, you know, for our indemnity obligation, this is excluded because, um, you know, it, condos are an excluded thing in our con, in our uh, policy. Um, so that's why it's really important to understand the difference between the duty to defend and the duty to indemnify. And, you know, I think from from a practical standpoint, the duty to defend is much more important um, because it takes a long time to get to the point where you're legally obligated to pay damages. Um, typically, you're going to have ongoing litigation for a while before you ever get to that point, if you ever do get to that point. Um, and so what you want is for your insurance to cover your defense, your attorney and everything needed to defend you in a lawsuit um, and hopefully resolve the lawsuit without ever getting to the point where, where the duty to indemnify comes up. So construction defect actions are governed by uh, a statute in Colorado called SADARA for short. It's short for Colorado Construction Defect Action Reform Act. Um, and this governs claims against any construction professional. Um, what I want to talk about, I mean, this is this is a pretty broad statute um, that has, you know, a lot of key provisions in it. But for purposes of what we're talking about today. Um, I just wanna talk about the notice of claim process because this is really the beginning of where your insurance carrier comes into the process. Um, and it's it's really the most important step, I think for you to be aware of, um, you know, when, when dealing with a potential claim of any kind um, and, you know, the process for actually using the insurance that you pay for. Um, Cause you know, you hope that you pay for it you pay your premiums and you never have to use it. But if you do have to use it, you know, this is how it's going to come up most likely. Um, so SADARA provides a notice of claim process. Um, it's It was put into effect um, in order to help with the very large volume of construction defect litigation that was going on um, when this law was passed. It was back in 2003, I believe, initially when this this law was passed, and it was the legislature's response to the very high number of construction defect claims that were happening. Um, and so they provide this notice of claim process in the statute in order to help resolve claims and, you know, disputes of construction defects before having to actually initiate full fledged litigation. Um, so 
in the notice of claim process, it, it basically the statute requires a plaintiff, um, which is typically, you know, the property owner, the homeowner or uh, owner of the commercial property. Um, it requires them to provide the construction professional with notice alleging uh, the defects, basically detailing what what is wrong that they're claiming um, at least 75 days before filing litigation. Um, and then in that notice, um, the construction professional, it basically will tell you, um, or at least they're supposed to tell you what's going on, what what they're planning to claim is defective. And then you are allowed to physically inspect the claim defects within 30 days after receiving the notice. Um, and that means, you know, you set up a time to go see the property and inspect what is allegedly defective about the work. Um, and then after that 30 day inspection period, um, the construction professional may offer to settle the claim um, through either correcting the work or paying a settlement amount to um, the claimant. If so, they don't have to accept the offer. So if you offer money or even if you offer to make repairs, um, that plaintiff may decide to reject the offer and then they can initiate litigation. Um, so they can still still pursue a lawsuit anyway, even if you follow this process and you offer them um, a settlement of some sort. But it does provide, you know, this process by which you will be notified of a potential claim and you do have an opportunity to inspect the issue and try to resolve it before litigation is um, initiated. So the thing I want to stress here, um, and this is this is a best practice, it's going to come up differently in different situations, but you want to put your insurance company on notice early as soon as you receive a notice of claim, or even if it's not um, a notice of claim pursuant to SADARA, if it's just, you know, you're aware that there's an unhappy um, homeowner who is likely to sue you and they've described defects to you in writing, um, you know, even if the process isn't being followed exactly how it's laid out in the statute, um, if you receive notice of a potential claim for construction defects, you should notify your insur insurance carrier as soon as possible and demand a defense. Um, if you don't put your carrier on notice, coverage could be denied or your premiums increased in the future or denied future coverage entirely. Um, and, you know, that could force you to have to shop some of those second tier policies that don't really provide um, adequate coverage. So you really want to um, put your insurance carrier on notice. And I've, I've heard, you know, from some that there's a fear of putting your insurance carrier on notice of a claim because a claim against you, even if it has no merit, might impact your insurance costs. So um, you might think that your premium could go up or, um, you know, be, you might be afraid that you can't get insurance in the future. And even if the claim has no merit, just telling them about a claim might harm your coverage. Um, it is far worse uh, to not notify them because, you know, you really want to be working with your insurance. That's why you have insurance. Um, and, you know, you can work with your insurance broker too to advocate for you with your insurance carrier um, to sort of decide the best course of action you won't necessarily always have a premium increase due to a claim, especially if it's one that you can resolve. So you wanna put your insurance carrier on notice as soon as you know that um, there's a claim coming along uh, and that way your insurance can step in, they can um, have an adjuster go and, and view the issues, um, do the inspection. It's great if the adjuster can attend the inspection and see what's being claimed. Um, and you know, you want your insurance carrier to pay for your attorney because that that's expensive. It can add up. And that's why you have insurance is to help you in the event that this happens. Um, so I can't stress enough, put them on notice as soon as you're put on notice, basically. Um, and that brings me to the topic of insurance defense counsel. 
versus personal counsel. Um, like I've described to you, uh, your insurance carrier's duty to defend means they retain uh, an attorney for you typically. Um, that attorney is chosen and paid for by the insurance company during your defense. Um, so you are actually that attorney's client, but you're not paying their bill. And so the scope of what that attorney can advise you on and the scope of their representation is limited to that case and that claim and can't extend to any advice about your insurance coverage um, or any coverage issues that you might have. So there is a limit to the scope of what your insurance defense counsel can provide you in terms of representation. Um, so, you know, and they're reporting to the insurance carrier too. So it's sort of, we call it the tripartite relationship. Um, so you have kind of a triangle, if you can imagine it, where you have the insurance carrier, you have the client and then the attorney. And so the attorney is kind of working for both, even though you are, um, for all intents and purposes, that attorney's client, um, because the insurance carrier is paying them. If there's ever any issue that comes up where you're sort of adverse to your insurance carrier, that puts that attorney in a conflict of interest position because they're being paid by them. So um, sometimes we, we recommend that um, if, if we're the insurance defense counsel, we might recommend that a client also retain personal counsel. And so that would be um, an attorney that's retained by you separately, privately, so paid for by you, um, who can advise you on all the issues that are outside the scope of the insurance counsel's representation. Um, so it's not paid for by your insurance, but that would ensure that there's no gaps in the legal advice that you're getting. Um, you know, and, and if, especially if you're in a very contentious lawsuit, you most likely will want to have both on your legal team. Um, the insurance defense counsel will most likely be doing all of the day-to-day -day work in the case. And so that huge chunk of costs would be covered by, you know, your insurance carrier, but personal counsel really comes into play if there's any issues. Um, with your coverage, if there's an exclusion that might apply, if there's a reservation of rights letter that raises issues, um, which often there is, then your personal counsel is the one who would be advising you about that and anything else in your policy that might be problematic because the insurance counsel can't really flag that for you. Um, so that's basically how, you know, insurance is going to come up. Um, if you ever get sued for construction defects, um, this, you know, it's it's never a good situation if if you do end up getting sued. But the reason you have the insurance is for that purpose. Um, so between that and bonds, you may or may not have bonds on a project, but you will always have insurance or you should always have insurance um, between these should help you uh, manage your risk and protect you. Um, and I do want to stress that, you know, if you did everything that your lawyers told you to do, um, we're looking at it from the standpoint of protecting you from liability. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of things that you are balancing as a business person, um, looking at, you know, all the costs of these things. And, and when you're bidding on a project, there's a lot of moving pieces. And so, you know, I'm not. I'm not really giving you advice on any of those things. I think um, if you do everything your attorney says, then you might go out of business. But, um, you know, it's also it's very, very important to be paying attention to your risk management um, and your insurance and your surety provider and your attorneys are the ones who are there on your team to help you um, avoid terrible situations with your with your uh, risk management strategy. Um, and, you know, you, you just kind of have to balance some of these best practices with what's realistic and what really applies to your situation. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, I wanted to sort of be done just talking at you a little before we're needing to be done um, so that 
I can actually interact with some of you. And if you have any questions, please um, put them in the chat. I know I covered a lot of uh, kind of complex things here and uh, it's Friday afternoon. So <laughs> I don't wanna just be, uh, you know, dumping information on you um, and would love to answer any questions while I'm here if you have them. And I just put up the uh, slide with my information. Um, please feel free to email me or call me if you have any questions in the future or if you need assistance with any legal issues. So I don't know, Deb, are you still here? So if anyone's on here, um, I did end a little bit early, so I'm here for questions if you have any. Um, I didn't want to go right up to the end of this, so I am, you know, just here to answer any questions you might have with the remainder of our time. I will keep an eye on the chat. Um, if anyone has anything, I'll be here, um, and I'll leave my information up so that you can um, see it in case you ever need to contact me. But um, that is it for my material today. So hopefully um, it wasn't too uh, terrible for a Friday afternoon, but uh, you know, we do our best. So, so yeah, I'm here um, if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, uh, I'll just leave it there. <laughs>